You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with Damian Swaby. Listen to conversations with award-winning filmmakers, directors from the golden age of television, and creatives from the indie film community who continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. And now, over to your host, Damien Swaby. Today on Filmmaking Conversations, I talk to Rebecca Esquiris, a director, writer, and producer whose work has screened at numerous international festivals, including SXSW, TIFF, SIF, Dead Center, and many more. Her debut project, What Breaks the Ice?, received the Sandra Adair Empowering a Billion Women grant for promising female filmmakers from the Austin Film Society. She was selected for the Austin Film Society's Artist Intensive, hosted by the one and only Richard Linklater. What Breaks the Ice is a coming-of-age thriller about two 15-year-old girls, Sammy and Emily, who hark from different worlds but strike up a quick and deep friendship. But what should be the best summer of their lives takes an unexpected turn when they become accidental accomplices in a fatal crime. The project was also a finalist for the 2016 Mayor's Office of New York Women in Film Producers Guild Financing Lab. The film was released theatrically across the US in October 2021 and is now available to stream everywhere. She has served as a panellist at numerous film festivals and recently participated in the New York Women in Film and Television From Script to Pre-Production Lecture Series. Mentored by the late, great Jonathan Demme, who directed Philadelphia, starring Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington. He also directed The Silence of the Lambs, starring Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins. My conversation with Rebecca is one you do not want to miss. But first, here is an audio essay from the great folks at Renegade Film Theory. In the show notes, you can find a link to the video version of this essay regarding one of HBO's finest shows. My hunch is that you're going to get fucked. And I've never seen Logan get fucked once. The third season of HBO's Succession has come and gone and left us with many questions about the future of the Roy family and the power structure of Waystar Royco. The third season's finale also left many fans reeling at the betrayal at its conclusion. I'll be the first to admit that I was left shocked at Tom's cunning coup, but as I had more time to stew on Tom's character progression over the show's three seasons and comb through past episodes, it became apparent to me that the seeds of Tom's betrayal were sown much earlier on. Succession is my favorite current TV show, and although it is hopefully far from over, I'm more than comfortable saying that it's one of my favorite shows of all time, elbowing and jostling with the likes of Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad. The love for Succession is mirrored by many as it succeeded Game of Thrones as HBO's flagship show, and to anyone who's followed the Roy family exploits through the last three seasons, it isn't difficult to see why. The performances are phenomenal, the locations are interesting, the documentary style camera work is fresh and holds you enthralled to the characters. But in my opinion, the aspect of succession that is the most responsible for its ascension to the throne of television is its writing. I've never seen a show or movie with punchier dialogue or more creative insults than Succession. That's about as choreographed as a dog getting fucked on roller skates. But that only addresses the surface level of the show's brilliance. The writing truly glimmers with its character creation and development. Probably the most unoriginal statement I could make about Succession is that it's a show about unlikable characters doing unlikable things and generally just being unlikable people. Making note of Succession's paradox of likability has become a cliché, but more often than not, clichés are thrown around to the point of irritation because there lies a kernel of truth within. 
Instead of using characters as cheap vehicles to drive home points and thinly veiled messages about the corrupting nature of power or the toxic elements of privilege, the writers of Succession strive to craft genuine human beings out of the noxious sludge of corporate America's vampiric elite. We aren't captivated by Succession's heinous troop of players because we want to vicariously live through their morally gray actions, but because, to a lesser degree, we can relate to some of their struggles and recognize the broad archetypes they represent in the people from our own lives. In Succession's cast of characters, Logan and his trio of ambitious offspring hog a great deal of the attention. They make up the top tier of Waystar Royco's hierarchy of power. But while some characters like Greg and Tom, who clasp tightly onto the threat of power, may be neglected by their fellow co-workers and family members, they're never neglected by the writers. And that fact is made clearer than ever in light of Tom's betrayal. Tom is an outsider. He and Greg form a tight bond because they both share a similar outsider status, but Tom arguably walks on thinner ice than Greg does due to his lack of Roy blood. This being the case, Tom has always been dependent on the crumbs of acceptance scattered at him from Logan and the rest of the Roys. Tom adopts an agreeable persona that allows him to absorb shockwaves of personal jabs, insults, and humiliation. What is it like to be married to a man with two assholes? Tom's persona of agreeableness allows him to mask his inner ambition, but that comes at a very steep cost, that being respect from the Roys, especially from that of Shiv. Shiv cheats on Tom. She floats the idea of them having an open relationship on their wedding night. She belittles him. She suggests throwing him under the bus on the boat, she doesn't discourage the idea of Tom sacrificing himself to go to jail, and she says to his face that, Even though I don't love you. Uh -huh. Shiv's disrespect of Tom knows virtually no bounds. If we accept what she says about not reciprocating his love as fact, it calls the very purpose of their union into question. How does their marriage serve her interests? How does it serve my interests? It's clear that love and settling down with a family aren't Shiv's prerogative. Shiv's express goal is to scratch and claw her way to the top of Waystar at any expense. For how Tom exactly fits into her cutthroat plan, I believe there is some insight to be had from Logan in what he says to his daughter on her wedding night. He tells her, You're marrying a man fathoms beneath you because you don't want to risk being betrayed. Shiv perceived Tom as the ideal partner because she knew of the power and control she lorded over him. But it doesn't quite address what Tom brought to the table himself. For insight into that, I think it's important to notice how in many ways Tom's relationship with Shiv mirrors his relationship to Greg. The dynamic between both relationships are flipped, but similarly toxic in nature. With Greg, Tom feels secure enough to let his guard down a little and be more open about his ambitions and concerns. Likewise, Shiv has in Tom someone that she can plot her schemes for the top with comfortably. These relationships with somebody lower on the power totem pole are necessary for Shiv and Tom because of how exhausting it is to breathe permanently wearing a bulky masquerade. But when that masquerade is tossed aside and the stream of raw emotions is allowed to flow, the toxic often commingles with the healthy. Advice. Just, you know, don't fucking bother, okay? The bullying of a perceived lesser in the hierarchy is indicative of Tom's character and his mental state. He's insecure about the uncertainty of his future and at times uses Greg as a punching bag to take his frustrations out on. Shiv's infidelity and lack of loyalty accentuate this in Tom. What appears to be the primary difference in Tom's relationships with Shiv and Greg is that Tom seems to grow closer to Greg and drifts further away from Shiv. Tom takes Greg under his wing, looks after him, but ultimately, he's seeking a lackey, 
someone to do his bidding and someone to whom he can express feelings he'd rather keep under lock and key around others while still retaining the ability to assert his power and higher status. I believe it's likely Shiv marries Tom for the same reasons. A marriage or even a friendship founded on such a precarious fault line isn't likely to stand the test of time. Because of this, I think it's very possible that Greg might be hiding a dagger or two with Tom's name etched on it up his sleeves in a later season. We know from the finale that Greg's self-confidence and ambition is growing. In the scene where he sells his soul to the devil, he specifically asks Tom if he can have his own lackeys as part of the deal. Although many people can only see the Greg and Tom dynamic trending upwards post-season 3, I think the essential ingredient that could incite a potential Greg betrayal is resentment. Being the inferior in a relationship and being the perpetual victim of the superior's slings and arrows will naturally create a petri dish for feelings of resentment and bitterness to grow powerful enough that they are translated into action. Tom's agreeable country mouse persona proves successful in deflecting attention from his ulterior motives. But in addition to the steady regimen of ridicule he received, it also painted a logical scapegoat's target on his back any time the company found itself in scalding water. I think it's likely that Tom does have genuine feelings towards Shiv. He refuses to acknowledge her affair when Greg informs him, and he appears truly hurt when Shiv shanks his ideas of starting a family and at her indifference at the prospect of him being incarcerated. When the Roy siblings are plotting in the car ride en route to killing their father, Tom's future prospects are treated as a minuscule detail to be ironed out after the fact. In that moment of peak resentment and quickly deteriorating cancer of the career, Tom makes his decision. But it wasn't just an impromptu split-second decision. It was one Tom was building up to all season long. In season 3, his relationship with Logan. Tom and Logan's bond has always been a bit rocky. But the two have a good deal in common. I would even go as far as to say that Logan has more in common with Tom than he does with any of his kids. The Roy siblings all operate in the cutthroat corporate world with a sense of entitlement. Gilded abundance is all they've ever known. A reality without it is nearly incomprehensible to them, as we can tell by the absolute state of disarray they find themselves in right before the credits roll on season 3. They take it for granted that the top spot is destined for one of them. Tom, like Logan, came from humble beginnings with a primal hunger to climb the ladder until they reached the top or died trying. All along, Tom has been much craftier and more calculated than he let on. He understood that, no matter the circumstances, Logan was the horse to back, even despite his advanced age and ailing health. In his quest to earn Logan's favor, Tom demonstrated two indispensable qualities, the first of which was loyalty. Tom's willingness to fall on the sword and go to jail for Logan earned him major points. But more important to Logan, Tom was willing to put business and the company above all else, even above family. This is the toughest of all of Logan's pre-qualifications to meet. Throughout the show, whenever Logan gets close to choosing his successor, he tests them to see where their first priority lies. Logan decides to not hand the firm over to Kendall in the first episode when he chooses to attend his father's birthday party instead of remaining in the office to close the acquisition deal. And in the finale of the second season, Logan decides to pass on Shiv when... Ironically, she sticks up for Tom and pleads for him to not go to jail. Roman gets passed up for a very different reason. To prove yourself an appropriate successor to Logan and to earn his respect, you have to be a killer, even if that entails killing a family member or spouse. You have to be a killer. Shiv failed to kill Tom. Kendall attempted to kill his father twice, but both times nearly ended up killing himself. 
In his efforts to escape from the bottom of the top of Waystar's hierarchy, Tom did what was necessary. He made a deal with the devil, and just like Nero, he killed his wife. Season 3 of Succession left the Roy siblings marooned in the middle of an ocean, facing an uncertain future without their birth-given stakes in the company. Tom secured his position and earned the respect of Logan, and he did it by being a killer. And now for my filmmaking conversation with Rebecca Esgress. Hi, Rebecca. How are you today? Good. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to finally be speaking with you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to speak to you. I just love when I go online and I find independent jewels, not just films. I find a jewel. And I found one when I watched What Breaks the Ice. So I can't wait to discuss that film with you in detail. But I'm always interested in people when they make such films and um, and why they make these type of films. Because I want to know the background in terms of their experience in, in film and the arts and as a human being as well, really. So how did you get your start in the industry before we start talking about your brilliant film? Thank you so much. You flatter. Um, <laughs> for people who are listening, I, I am blushing. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I started, um, you know, I've, I've always, even as a child was, um, always very fascinated with the arts. And for me, film is such an incredible medium, uh, for expression because it combines so many different kinds of artistic expression. You have drama and, you know, the, the, actually the literary words on the page and you have cinematography and you have music and, you know, you have all of these incredible collaborative, creative ways that people come together to create real life on screen. So that's always what cap, cap, captivated me very much from a young age. Um, I guess my first foray actually in the industry as a job was after I graduated from college, I worked in the news business as a writer and producer for um, a business magazine, uh, Forbes. And uh, but that was really where I got to see, you know, just kind of being on the ground and telling stories on the fly and um, kind of just stoked my desire to to dig deeper and tell longer, more meaningful stories, I guess. Not that the news isn't meaningful, but, you know, the stories we were doing were two or three minutes and I wanted to do something deeper and bigger. And so I moved out to L.A., went to graduate school at USC and I started working on, you know, various film sets. I found my way uh, into working uh, at, in feature film production at, at the studio level as like a junior executive. And I got to really understand how movies get made. And, um, and it's a really interesting process, um, very different from, you know, when you're starting out and it's just you and your friends and cameras and, you know, the, the studio system is, is really a, a behemoth. But but I, I got to understand how the business side of things worked. And that's when I started to put the pieces together of what I would want to be the first film that, that I would direct. The journey is a long one, but um, I'm not that old, but you know, there are many pieces to it. But um, once I made that decision that I, I felt that where I began was, uh, I come full circle, which is that I still really wanted to write and direct my own films. And so then really pivoted from learning the business and working in the business to moving towards the goal of actually um, making a screenplay that I had written. And I'd written quite a few at that point, but I had one in mind that in particular that I wanted to make, which was, which was this film. You mentioned there's many, many aspects that go into making a film. There's music, there's cinematography, there's the writing, there's directing, there's the audio. How did you get to the point in your career and in your mind that you felt confident to be able to put all of these things together and understand them well enough to make a feature film? Sure. Well, I think always it's a leap of faith. Um, you don't know until you're doing it, but I, I was, I was fortunate enough. I did have a background, um, in classical music from growing up. Um, and, uh, I had studied English and art history and, um, literature and, drama in, in college. Um, I was a big Shakespeare nut. Um, and, uh, and I think that everything builds upon itself. And eventually you get to a point where you, um, 
you have to trust yourself and you have to surround yourself with really great collaborators. And it, it, with this screenplay in particular, I spent a lot of time on it, not only tell, making a story that I really felt compelled to tell, but also that I felt was <laughs> having read thousands of screenplays myself, I wanted to write one that I knew, hopefully, that when people got it and read it, they would be excited to work on it. So that was definitely something that I spent a lot of time um, on in the in the process of when we were putting the film together. Um, but getting back to what you were saying earlier about like why this film, why this story, what kind of drew me to it was um, I, I'm obviously like you, I know a, a film buff and love watching movies and um, learning from movies and wanting to make movies for my whole life. So a lot of filmmakers that I really look up to, one of whom is uh, Richard Linklater. And in the summer of 2000, one of the greats. And so during the summer of 2014, I actually got to go to a screening of an early screening of his film Boyhood, which is a brilliant movie and uh, on so many levels. And, uh, and I started thinking, well, if I were going to make a film about girlhood, let's say is just a beginning place, what would that story look like? And so I just started writing these like vignettes of conversations between friends and memories from my adolescence. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of what this this film became. Excellent. And and what it became was truly beautiful. I, I really, really loved it, as I said earlier. And you've mentioned great collaborators, which I believe is the key. And I, I know you have them because I've watched the film. The cinematography is brilliant. The two lead actress, everybody in it's brilliant. But when it comes to casting, and getting your crew together. What process do you go for and how long does it take you? Yeah, so with this film in particular, um, <clears throat> every film has its own journey, I think, um, for sure. With this one, because we spent so much time um, developing the script, getting it into really tip-top shape, um, we had a really sophisticated pitch book that I had put together with, uh, one of my producers. We also did a proof of concept, which was like kind of a a mood trailer that we sh I shot with some friends to really show what the film would feel like um, to to show investors and collaborators. So by the time I came to the table and was taking meetings with people, I felt like we really knew what movie we were making, which was very helpful for me, especially being that this was my first feature as a director. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was very fortunate with my collaborators on the cinematography side. Greta was somebody that I had never actually met in person, but we had a lot of different ways of knowing each other and had, um, I had seen her previous work. I thought she was great. Um, <clears throat> we had, um, I knew a director that she had worked with and she knew people that I knew. And so by the time I sent her the script and I was like, well, we're like only a couple weeks out of hopefully shooting this thing. Um, she was keen to, to have a conversation with me uh, because of the people that we knew in common. And I remember she was coming back from shooting another movie in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. It's actually what they're called. They're the, the Smoky Mountains and um, literally the Smoky Mountains. Oh, and, okay. um, and she was on the phone driving back and she said, you know, send me the script. I'd be happy to read it. Um, I've got a window in the fall. And if it makes sense, I sure, let me, let me take a look. And she called me back like two days later and was like, I know we don't have a lot of time to put this together, but, wow. but let's do it. And, uh, and that was the beginning of a really amazing collaboration. She did a really beautiful job. And then on the casting side of it, yeah, she did, especially yeah, I mean, she, little we, time. we shot on, um, you know, that's always the, the pleasure of working with people who are who are young and hungry and well connected. You know, she was able to hook us up with these really beautiful anamorphic lenses, which I think give this very like majestic feel. Mm. You because you know, for people who haven't seen the film yet, we shot in upstate New York, and there are these really beautiful vistas and landscapes, and the wide the wide uh, frame of these lenses uh, really gives you a sense of space and of place and sort of being contained in this 
unique universe for the span of the film, which is really what we were going for. Um, and then, and then on the casting end, you know, I worked with a very brilliant casting director who really helped me, uh, kind of how to approach the actors that, that I wanted. Cause I had spent a lot of time thinking about who I wanted for those lead roles. And, you know, it's a, it's a game. You gotta, you gotta put a great package together and go out to their agents and make it seem like you're going to be professional because they're used to working with Netflix and big TV shows and movie studios. And they want to know that if they're sending their client out on an, on an independent film, that it's going to be a good film and it's going to be professionally run and it's going to be finished and, you know, all of those things. So it was definitely an adventure, but I think very blessed with our with our with our cast a lot of people when they make films some are for rehearsals and some are against it they want things to be more organic on the day considering the type of performances you got from actors did you encourage rehearsals independently or along with yourself and maybe other people in the crew yeah so great great question and, and very good good point because um it's true. Actors all have their own way of working. I mean, look, we didn't have a ton of time to rehearse, but actually what was cool was Sophia and Maddie actually really did become best friends uh, rather quickly. Oh. Uh, and they, um, and what I kind of what became our process was I would meet with them the night before we would talk about what we were going to be shooting the next day. Schedule was always changing, but you know, I wanted them to know what, what was coming up Yeah, and, um, and we would talk about stuff, but they, they really liked to rehearse together without me and then bring me what they had worked on. And then we would talk about it, which I actually really enjoyed Brilliant. because I wrote the script and I yeah. lived with it for so long. And, and I think that it was great that they were, they wanted to bring me something new about something that I wrote. And that really helped my process because it allowed me to step away from the material and see it in a different way. And we didn't have time to rehearse every scene, of course, but you know, there were even times on set where I was consumed with, you know, another scene I was working with other actors on or, a, you know, another decision I had to be making. Yeah. And while we were lighting, I couldn't be in the room with them all the time while, until we did a blocking rehearsal. Right. So sometimes I would come in and we would talk about stuff and then, and we would rehearse and we would find that they'd be like, Oh, well, I would never say this. Oh, well, I think this, and we would re literally rewrite the scene on the set, which was great. And then for some of the bigger pieces that required some rehearsal and obviously memorization on their part, sometimes we would rehearse together, but more often than not, they really enjoyed bringing me their ideas and having us talk about it together. And those were some of my most favorite moments on set because like I could, I could sit here and tell you the entire screenplay by heart, but that's not a movie, right? A movie is what the, what your, what your collaborators bring to it. And so, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I enjoyed the spontaneity of it. And I enjoyed that it made it feel authentic. So when you first, when you had your final draft, how long ago was that? The, the script that I went out with was in March of 2018. And then we locked the script for shooting in August of 2018. And I made some changes while we were on location. So probably like September 12th. So it's, you know it's three years ago already, but we had six in the six months between the script that we went out with, we made, we made changes as we were going along both because of um, technical things that I worked out with Greta and with our, you know, Meg and the other who was our production designer and other collaborators. And then because of talent, we made some additional script changes into like the first week of production. And please do tell us what, era is this film set in? Yeah, so it's set in the late 90s, um, the summer of 1998, which was a really, um, it was a fun challenge for all of us. And we tried not to, you know, point a finger at the time period, sort of feeds into the, the, um, the thematic through line of the film. 
Because like, I want you to constantly be questioning how much has changed and how much hasn't changed. And, um, and I think it works. Uh, people have commented on all sorts of ways, but there's one pivotal scene, which I won't give away, but I'm sure you're aware of having watched the film that definitely gives away what the period of time is. Um, commenting on political situations in, in the United States at the time. Um, but look, our crew did an amazing job. We Our visual effects budget was $100. We had no special effects in this. Everything was done practically. And actually the one thing, and not, this is no knock on our sound guys because they were rock stars, but there was one scene that there's a boom in the shot and we, and so we had to get rid of it. So that we spent $100 to get rid of a boom. But otherwise, we didn't have any... I mean, we did some... We did some, like, stuff in the DI just to, like, you know, make the focus a little shallower on certain things so you can't see, like, a car that might not be period appropriate in the distance. But for the most part, we didn't do anything. It was all done practically on set with wardrobe, with production design, um, and with lens choices. See, that's what I, I really wanted to to bring up as well, because I personally believe, and I think some filmmakers do, if someone said to me, um, make a, a, a short film or a feature film in 1980s Piccadilly in, in London, I, I think it would be, it would be a challenge. But if someone said to do it for 1998, it's far away, but it's close. So it's it's harder if you get what I mean. You could accidentally see a Mercedes that's it shouldn't be there because it's too new. It's like two thousand and three or something like that. So I really ad admire when people take upon that challenge and and make it work. So in terms of costume, for example, how much time would the cast be with a, a costume designer, and what type of decisions would go into it? Considering some of the things you would have to have got for these ladies and the rest of the cast, they might not be available in your regular footlocker or wherever you're going to get items of clothing. Was it a case of jumping on eBay and, and bidding for items? Or is there somewhere in particular that you can go in America that gives you clothing from 1998 that would be suitable for your film? Great question. So our, product, our, our production design and costume design team actually kind of teamed up together and they really collaborated like as, as like one unit because there are some things that are considered props and some that are wardrobe and, and they were also, because they were both looking for period items, they were really looking to collaborate also on their, like you're saying, on the resources of where they were looking for these things. So we did, they, not we, I mean, I wasn't there. I can't take any credit for it, but a lot of thrift stores, secondhand stores, the internet. Um, you know, we were kind of fortunate that some trends from the 90s were coming back now. So there were things, but but even, you know, Brianna, our costume designer pointed this out that even if something was like a throwback, the like the cut is always slightly different or the, the look is slightly different. And, you know, just, so she was very on point about making sure that things weren't modern day trying to be like 90s throwback, like they really were a period appropriate piece. Um, and then also one of our producers, funny enough, uh, who's around my age, she had a lot of her old like hair clips and things like that from home that she brought on set and, um, old old dresses she had saved that fortunately fit one of our actors. Uh, so it was really just sourcing from a lot of different places. Um, you know, the New York world of costume and production design is different than LA. LA is very like prop houses, costume houses. Like you go over to the studios and there's like, you know, a warehouse full of stuff that you can kind of pick out from. And there's places that specialize in creating things, which they'll ship anywhere around the country, you know, that you need. But New York is definitely a bit more of a practically sourced environment, but you also have like, there's a great thrifting community here, a great vintage community here, and especially also even upstate where we were shooting. So they definitely pulled from a lot of different places to get the look right. Um, and then 
yeah and then sometimes you just have to like buy a t-shirt and cut it to make it look like it's of the right period and things like that which they were working with and brianna's an incredible seamstress and she really made it work i mean it's seamless you can't who would you would never know watching the film i thought to myself you know this is something special and and speaking to you today and, and some of the stuff we've picked up on upon so because of your background in news and and classically trained and obviously as a screenwriter i imagine you you really do see the world and have an opinion and your own voice but when you make a film like this with starring two leading ladies in such a film is one of those characters you i think they're both me i mean the the joke i always make is this is you know it's about me except you know i know ne- i never killed anyone um that you know of uh but uh, <laughs> but um, I think that they both draw on different parts of me, friends of mine that I've had over the years, conversations I've had, friends, conversations friends have told me they've had. Um, you know, I, I think that they both show a different side of female adolescence. You know, I think that there's a when you're that age, there are things that you're wise beyond your years about. And then there are things that you think you know, and you're completely naive about reality. And that's really what I wanted to show through their friendship and through their different life experiences. Um, And also that, especially when you're that age, you don't think about why you want to become friends with somebody, you just do. And uh, there's one woman, friend of the film who had watched an early cut and who came on board because she really liked the the script very much and this is a woman who's in i would say probably in her late 50s or early 60s and she goes yeah you know when you're that age you just smell who you want to be friends with and it's true i mean i think that that's where the reality of the film comes in and and we talked a lot about this early on is you have to buy into the fact that sammy and emily are instant best friends and if you can buy into that then you can buy into the whole film. And I think that that was really the success of of them as the leads in this film was you buy them as best friends and they really became best friends. And and then I think from there, uh, whatever questions you might have about the trajectory of their choices, the logic is built into it because you buy that they are, that they really that they are best friends and that they would they would stick up for each other in the way that they do. Did you get the chance to show your film or script to people around that age? I did actually. She's no longer that age, but my I have a I'm very close with my cousin. Uh she's a couple years quite a few years younger than me, but we're very close. And I had her read a couple of drafts of the script and I was like, does this feel right to you? Like does this And, you know, she's a Gen Z, so different times. But, yeah, she was like, I could totally buy into this and watched early cuts of the film. And and she was like, yeah, I feel like it's not. She's like, on the one hand, I feel like it's not my generation. But on the other hand, I do. Because what's the difference, right? We were talking earlier about period piece. The only thing that defines something of the near past is the technology, the cars, and the clothes. Everything else in the near past is just... You know, it's it's kind of the same. So she's like, yeah, it's different. Like, I feel like if this were about my friends and I, we'd like be on our phones or we'd be on like making videos or like texting or this or that. But other than that, she didn't feel like it was it wasn't authentic. And then I think also to the point of the casting where um, both girls were, um, I mean, they were still teenagers when we made the film. Maybe Maddie had just turned 20. Uh, just turned 20, but they were young. I mean, they I we, we purposely cast, I didn't want people in their 20s playing teenagers. Uh, and the fact that they connected to the material and they found a way into yeah. it and to make it their own also helped me feel like it was authentic to the, to their, to the experience. If they didn't connect to the material, how do you think that would have changed your direction as a director because sometimes people don't connect to material and they may be in lead positions not just um in the cast but the crew and it's just a job for them 
how would that have affected you? Well, I think it would have been really hard because um, short of having a great time on set, um, making a movie like this is very difficult and you really have to be in it. And believe me, they told me, like I said, when we were, when you were talking earlier about rehearsal or rewrites or they, because they presented a, a very positive united front to me, they would tell me when they didn't think things were working. I can think of one scene in particular that I really love. It's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. And they came to me and said, we love this scene, but we feel like half of it needs to go. And this is a line that we would say this line this way, or we would say this that way. But the, the, the theme of the scene remained, but they really helped me see how it could be better and how it could be theirs. And it could be theirs in the sense that they became these characters. You know, no matter who Sammy and Emily are on the page, they are now, Sammy and Emily is seen through the eyes of Sophia and Madeline, which is not who I wrote. It's, it's different. So I tried to, for the most part, listen to them. And I even remember one time, this was actually kind of funny. I felt like a mom. <laughs> we were... We were shooting a scene and we were setting up the camera and the two of them were talking about something. And I went over and I started giving them all these things to do or that I was thinking about. <coughs> Excuse me. And Sophia goes, Rebecca, just let us do it and then come back and tell us what you think. <coughs> and I really appreciated that because <clears throat> excuse me, it made me feel like they had really embodied these characters and it was now not just mine. And I respect that. That's the, that's the best place to be as a, as a director and as a writer is that your actors or your crew, they care so much about this that they've internalized it and made it their own and are bringing something of themselves into it, which is only going to make it better. And the great thing about that also is you created an environment and your personality and talent and commitment must have shown on them where they thought we're going to be as clear and honest with you and we feel free to communicate that with you. Because sometimes if actors, there can be an issue where they're not communicating with the director properly because there is some sort of, uh, maybe not animosity, but professional lack of communication that shuts down the ability to be open with each other. With the crew, did you have that same kind of connection between you and your producer and you and your DP? Yeah, it was a, it was a great, it was a, it was a very hard movie. And I think we all really bonded with, with the limitations and the excitement of what we were creating. Yeah. Like I, and I think every movie's hard. I say this was hard because we, I mean, you know, you're a filmmaker yourself, so you understand. I mean, you you watch the movie. This was still a low budget movie. So we were, we had a lot of time constraints, budget constraints. The weather was great and then it wasn't great. We had kind of a wonky schedule. Um, but with the crew, I mean, everybody was fiercely committed to the story. And we had some hard days for sure but we use that as an opportunity to challenge ourselves as far as what we could capture and what we could create. Um, and uh, like I said earlier about our costume and production design teams that they sort of like banded together and made this like super department that really supported each other. Um, Greta and I, um, you know, we tried our best to like shot list the whole movie before we shot it which is very hard when you don't even know half your locations, but we at least had ideas in mind, not blocking or this or that, but like techniques of when we were going to be on handheld or when we were going to, how many days we needed the steady cam and when we were going to use that, when we were going to be on the tripod, when, you know, trying to anticipate the look of the film before we shot it, as far as just pure technique and lens choices. And then obviously once you're on set and you're rehearsing and you're in your location, all those decisions get tweaked and changed and all of that. But um, I really felt very lucky. I felt that I had, I really had the support 
of the people behind me. And, um, and the cast was amazing, as I've said. But yeah, I think to your point, the one thing that you can try your best to control as a director and, and good luck because you can't always control it is like the vibe of your set. And sure, were there, were there times I got frustrated? Yes. Can, can you give us an example of when you got upset? We were, I can think of one in particular. Uh, we were shooting, uh, we had one day with a process trailer. So for people who don't know what that is, it's basically like a tractor trailer that comes that you can attach a vehicle to and you can do like driving shots or it, you can use them for stunts, but primarily they're used like you put a vehicle on, like think of it like a like a big truck, but instead of having a something on the back of it, like a, a container or whatever else, it's a flatbed that you can put a vehicle on and shoot like a dr- like driving sequences. And so we had one day to get all of these scenes on this process vehicle because it was expensive and we couldn't really, we couldn't afford it for more than one day. We could barely afford to have it at all. And we were running behind on that day and it started to rain and we, you know, we didn't get everything that I wanted. And now it's like 10 o'clock at night and it's pouring rain and I want to shoot this scene and we can't shoot it. And you know, just like everything's just kind of getting a bit out of control. And um, yeah, we were shooting in this, it's a like a state park. Uh, so it was close to the public. We had the road closed off and there was a lake by the, by the area that we were shooting, like that people normally would just go to on like a, you know, a weekend to relax. And I just went over to the lake and I, by myself, and I just screamed as loud as I could. It was just like, I need to get all of this frustration out of me because there's nothing that I can do to control this. I can't make it stop raining. We can't afford another day with this thing. Whatever we can get is what we're going to get. And we ended up actually shooting some stuff in the rain and it actually came out great and we used it and I think it looks really cool. Um, But I was just frustrated about what I couldn't control and that there are people around me that are working really hard and trying their best and I can't make any of it go faster and I can't change anything. And so, yeah, I was angry and I was frustrated and I went off and I screamed as loud as I could. And then I came back and I was like, you know what? It is what it is. Like, I I can't change this. And, um, and there are days like that. And then you also have these days where you, you know, you, Greta and I would talk about this often. We'd like, we got, we would get together after we shot the film and be like, do you remember that day? And she'll be like, no, I don't, I don't really remember that day. Like it happened, but I don't remember it. Like in the way that you just, so much happens every day, but you don't even remember how you did it. You just got through it. Um, and it, and I think in a, in a way it makes you better because you're not overthinking everything. You're just kind of going with what feels, what feels right. And you have a plan and you're sticking to it. And if you overthink it too much, it actually works against you. I see. I see. That's a very, very interesting thing to say. And I can't disagree with that one. And you're in this community with so many beautiful locations and, and homes and all the rest of it. What were the local community like when you've come in here to make this film? They were great. Uh, upstate New York is kind of a perfect they're in a perfect sweet spot, which I fear will be ending soon now that they're more keen to the to how many productions have been coming up there, especially bigger ones. Like a lot of big film and TV shows are shooting up there now. Um, but they were great. They were aware enough of what the process is. But also excited about it. So... And funny enough, one of the houses that we shot in, um, you know, one of the ho- the homeowner used to make us Turkish coffee every morning because he was like, I have a film crew in my house. I'm going to make you guys coffee. And he was really great. And and funny enough, we were shooting another location in town and he just like showed up on set. And he was like, and you know, he was like, yeah, yeah I know. The, I know that I know the team. They're, I'm cool. He just like came on set. I'm at the monitor, like, turn around and there's, <laughs> there's Guy, uh, the homeowner. Super nice guy. Um, And then 
um, another homeowner that we shot in her house, she advertised on Airbnb that there was going to be a live film crew and got more money for like another side property that she had because they were going to get to come on set and meet the crew. That was funny. Um, you know, we closed down a street to shoot some scenes and the, the local community was very nice about it. We had, we had, I mean, we got into locations I never dreamed we would be able to through personal connections. So it was a really positive experience as far as the community is concerned. You know, like you were saying earlier about, well, what would it be like to shoot a you know, film set in the 90s in London? I think it would have been a lot harder to shoot this movie in, in a city. I think that the fact that we were kind of in the suburbs and in the country really helped it. Um, both from a community support standpoint and also just general ease of getting about and doing things, it was a lot easier. That's amazing how friendly and welcoming people were. And what does Turkish tea taste like? Oh, oh, it's coffees. It's oh, coffee. very strong, which is wonderful. When you're, it's Turkish coffee. It's very strong, which is exactly what you need when you're in the last week of production. <laughs> so it's like this... Um, Although I've heard Turkish tea is incredible too. This coffee, it's like this very thick coffee ground. Mm. And he would make it for us and then pour it. And it was delicious. I mean, whatever. It kept me going and it was delicious. So I see. It was, it was great. So you have the film finished now, obviously. It's, it's out there for, for people to, to watch and enjoy. What's your next plan? And what's the next film we're going to be able to see from you? Yeah, so I've, you know, I've been working on a couple of different things on my own. Um, but I can actually say now, because we just announced it, I'm attached to direct another film this in this late spring, early summer. Um, it's called Clear Mind. And it's a uh, sort of thriller, drama, comedy. Uh, that's sort of, it's a more of a contained story than this one. It's about a group of friends that go away for the, weekend after one of their one couple has suffered a, a tragedy in their family uh, but it sort of explores the dark side of what's become actually a real thing which is virtual reality therapy um, and it sort of uses that as a context for exploring um, how we process grief and anger about loss um, and it sort of treats the topic in a bit of a satirical way, but the script's really good. It came to me, um, to direct and I'm really excited about it. So we've just started the casting process on that. Um, we'll be going into that in the new year, new year, excuse me. And then, yeah, we'll be shooting in, in like late spring, early summer, and hopefully it'll be out next year. And it's this something your agent got you or how do you get these, uh, scripts sent to you? Comes all different ways. Um, this one came to me through a combination of direct contact and my agent. Um, so woman who's a, a accomplished actor and writer, and we had ways of knowing each other uh, through our network, and um, and she submitted the script to me that way. And um, but yeah, things come all different ways. Um, some another project I'm working on was is based on a true story, but came to me through a, a mutual friend and it's that's one that I'll be writing. So yeah, it projects come all different ways. Um, oh. And sometimes it's just things I want to do on my own and no one's paying me to do them. I just want to do it. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Kind of like this one. Uh, that's how it started. So are you thinking of taking your DP with you? Cause it sounds like you've got a great relationship. So is this, a film you believe Greta would be able to do very well? Well, I might, Greta might have graduated to bigger movies since, uh, <laughs> since I've worked with her, but we'll see. Um, you know, I, I always would hope I have the opportunity to work with her again at some point. You know, she's on to, she's on to all sorts sense. of different that things. That's, what's a, that's, the only t that's the only tough thing sometimes being the director is you live with your project the longest of anyone else you know, you, you're with it for years and you hope that your work gives people the opportunity to get to their next big thing and big thing and move on with their career. And I always joke, like, everyone's like, they're like onto their, you know, fourth movie since I made this one. Um, but 
you know, you always hope that you can come back and collaborate together. And if the opportunity presents itself, amazing. And if not, I always say there will there will be more. There will be others. See, I always admire writer directors because I find it very difficult to write something and direct it. And the reason why is because, like, we talk about the collaborative experience. If I've written it and I'm not getting potentially what you got from the two leading ladies in your film, it's kind of like it's all just me, me, me. And it needs layers of other opinions for it to really bloom. Do you prefer writing or directing? It's a great question. You ask a lot of good questions. Oh, um, thank you. I don't have a preference. <laughs> I don't have a preference. I think it depends on my mood. Um, if it depends when you ask me that question. If I'm feeling, if I'm feeling kind of lonely or isolated or feeling like I've just been living a hermit's life, then I'll tell you that I love directing because I miss it. And I miss being out on, on set with people, making something, creating something, um, the energy of it, the excitement, the stress, all of it. If I'm burnt out and I've been out and about and traveling and I'm tired and overextended and missing my, you know, my little, my little cave, then I'll tell you, I love, I love writing more because I'm craving that isolation to just think and be alone with my thoughts and my computer and living in my imagination. So I don't have a preference for one or the other. I think it just kind of, I think I'm the, I'm the right set. I have the right sensibility as a person because I can, I like living in both places. Um, and I don't have a particular pension for one or the other. I think it just depends where I'm at. Like right now, <clears throat> I was really excited that this project came along because I've spent the last year and a half, like living with my film coming out and writing. And I've been writing and researching and I wrote, wrote a script during COVID and I've been researching two others. And so I'm so excited to get back on set and I'm excited to like be back collaborating with other people. Um, but then I think when that's over and I'll really crave going back to my little space and, and writing. And I think it, as long as I can keep that wave going, it, it suits me quite well. Understandable. That, that makes complete sense. But how would you feel if someone had read your script and they said, I know the director for this, would you be able to let that baby go and not be on set? Just you only get to see it when it comes out. It's funny. We had this conversation uh, with one of with our like our core producing team way back where they said, well, you know, you came up working in development. Like what would happen if a company that you used to work for or somebody else says, you know, we want to make this, but we want to make it for more money than you, you're going to get to make it for. But you don't get to direct it. And um, there was a time when I would have said yes to that. Uh, I would have said, yes, buy the script off me. I'll, I'll, I'll direct the next one. I really would have. I think things changed for me when I had the opportunity to be part of this like very prestigious lab pro program here in the U.S. through the Austin Film Society. And a lot of the purpose of that lab was to, um, to be mentored and supported as a, as a writer director. And after I went through that process, which was a year before we shot the film, I felt like, okay, now I'm sort of attached to the idea of me directing it. And I, I think I'd have a hard time letting it go. And I think if you have the opportunity when you're for your first film to be the writer director, it sets a precedent where even if you aren't the writer director going forward, you, you show yourself as capable of being that. And I wanted to showcase both of those with one film where people can see I can write a movie and I can also direct a movie. And I don't have to do that in two separate pieces. And so when the opportunity came to be able to do that, I was really excited. But there was definitely a period of time before that where if the right director came along and the money came along and they were like, sorry, you're not going to get to direct this. I probably would have said yes, because I would have wanted the opportunity for something I made to be produced. I completely understand that. And you've done it. You've shown you can do it. 
so in many ways why go back um yeah why give up your your voice what you put out there what you can put out there more than capable of putting out there uh, go for it and keep doing it and keep doing what you can and i love thinking about those anamorphic lenses i think i said to you in an email about the opening shot i was just like okay this is going to be special this is this is something and you, what your colorist done i don't know if your editor was the colorist or you had a separate colorist but it all it all came out really really well especially for you know an indie as you said um working in certain locations on certain 100 pounds to remove the boom um what what software was used to remove the boom did did they use da vinci or after effects or do you know it was it was da vinci okay um I and we use... it was da vinci and we did have a we did have a separate colorist who was quite talented um sky man named nat jenks who um is extremely talented and works with some of the best directors in the world and i was oh. so lucky to get to work with him um he did a great job for us um and uh our editor uh she edited on the avid we worked out of her house uh in brooklyn nice and uh yeah very nice very nice I really, really am happy for you got to work with so many talented and great people. So Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. And you letting us know yeah. about the ins and outs of your film and thank the you. great cast and crew you worked with and how it went. And, I, and in the show notes, I'll be putting links for it for people to go and check it out wherever it's available. And please do check it out. It's really, really worth watching. So that will be in the show notes for everybody to watch. Thank you so much. I loved being on here. I'm glad that you found me and hope to do it again soon. You ask, you, you're a great interview. So thank you for a great conversation.